Good morning, everyone, and happy Thursday. Thanks for joining us for our sixth tech webinar this year. My name is Jamie Stiglitz. I'm the custom solutions project manager and engineer for Swage Lock Michigan Toledo, and I'll be your host today. Real quickly, I just want to go over a couple things you might be noticing here if you're new to these types of events. You have probably noticed already, but your camera and microphone are turned off, and on the right side of the screen, you should see a handy Q&A feature. If you have any questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to submit them there with your first and last name as the presentation goes on. And we'll take some time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. If for some reason that function is not working, please email your questions to solutions.michigan at swagelock.com and we will add your questions to the list for our presenter. With that out of the way, I would like to now welcome back Anthony Connors for joining us. Anthony is a chemical engineer graduating from Michigan State. He joined us at Swage Lock Michigan Toledo two and a half years ago and is our field engineer. He'll be taking us through the webinar today on regulator basics and selection. So without further ado, I now turn it over to Anthony. Hey, yeah, thanks, Jamie, and good morning, everybody. Hope, hope everybody's enjoying their Thursday here today. Um, I'm going to be walking through the basics on reg regulators here and uh, before we move on I just want to touch on this picture here because this really encompasses what, what we're trying to accomplish here you know all, all, all these regulators do the same thing but they tend to look and, and, and perform in different ways so we're going to hopefully try to tackle the complexity here with all these uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, so back to our usual what, what, what when and why here so what are we trying to do today? We're going to go over the overview of regulator functions and types. And when do we want to be using this in information? This will be during the design and uh, system evaluations. And we want to be doing this to make sure that our, re our regulator works correctly the first time. And we'll be doing this by going over the different regulator types. We're going to walk through the regulator mechanics and then cover some of the common issues and fixes that you might be seeing in the field there. So to kick things off, you know, what exactly is a reg regulator? Um, basically, it is a pressure controlling device. Uh, it forms and has, has two different basic functions here. You can either get them in a pressure reducing model or a back pressure model. Um, you can also, these, these are what, what I tend to call uh, self-actuating with control um, because you're going to be able to dial that, that handle down where uh, you'll be actually setting your pressure that, that you want. And then from there, the regulator is going to self-actuate and, and control the pressure that, that you had set. Um, if we look at the picture on the right here in our process, is generally where we're going to see these two models here. So before the process, we'll see the pressure re reducing regulators, and these will be controlling the downstream pressure. So these will generally be before our process. Um, and on, on the flip side, after the process, we, we can use back, back pressure regulators to control the upstream pressure. Um, it's, it's very important to note that regulators are not contr flow controllers. Uh, these will get you to the pressure that you're going to need at a specific flow, but it is then your job to control that flow with something else, say it be a needle valve or a restrictive orifice. Um, but a lot of people tend to pick these for flow, flow controllers, and that's not what they're generally used for. So now if we walk through different types in the swage lock world, we have uh, two series of reg regulators. We have the K series and the RHPS series. And you'll find the K series is generally in the in our uh, general purpose ca category here. Uh, you'll see it a lot in analytical or instrumentation ap applications. And if you get on to the right side of the RHPS, that's generally going to be used for a more high, high demand or process. So, um, Think of like your, your big uh, process lines. If you're dealing with um, higher pressures, that's that's when you'll you'll flip over to that side. But with both series, you're generally going to see the same same different types of regulators. You'll have your pressure reducing and your back pressure, and then for both, you also have uh, special applications. So, if if we walk through our K series, you know you've probably seen these the green handles. Um, You'll have your normal pressure, pressure reducing, your back pressure ones that generally look the same. But then on the special application side, you can run into things that'll be like a changeover reg regulator panel. Uh, we also sell uh, um, vaporizers that can be either steam or electric powered. And our, on, on the RHPS series, you'll you'll see the same thing. So we'll have the pressure reducing back pressure. 
Uh, the RHPS is generally noted with like a red handle for the standard pressure reducing and the back pressures are kind of shown with that blue handle. And these and these models will generally be larger due to the uh, higher higher demand and higher process lines that they'll be installed in. Um, the special app applications can also run into our things like tank plank, tank blanketing or sanitary. Uh, but for, for for the sake of this presentation, we're going to be using that K series pressure reducing model there to run through all of our examples. So how exactly does a regulator work? Uh, I mentioned before that this is a self actuating with control. And if you see on the right, you see a bunch of different moving parts that kind of make these things look pretty complicated. But today we're going to be really focusing on the four control elements that'll mainly be working for the re regulator function. So if we break this down, we have you know our two control elements, which will be our uh, seat and poppet here located on, on the lower half of the regulator. And then on the loading and sensing element, we're, we're going to focus on that range spring and then also the diaphragm. <clears throat> so how these actually work. So if we point out, you know, we have our four elements that I mentioned on, on the previous slide here. If we're to run through, you know, how how this operates, we're going to have our high inlet pressure and enter our reg regulator. And what and once this happens, you're going to start to turn that handle. And as as you're turning that handle, you're going to actually com compress that spring. And and what that does is that's going to um, move that pop it and and push it downwards. And eventually, your re regulator will open. And as it opens, you're you're going to start to bleed that high pressure uh, fluid over to your low side of the um, re regulator, and you'll have your low pressure outlet exiting the regulator. Once it's once it's set and it's reached that low pressure that that you had set, the re regulator will then move into its self actuating, and uh, the diaphragm or piston, depending on which which um, model you have, will actually balance those forces together to maintain that uh, pressure that you had set. So a as I mentioned there, the self actuating part is re reliant on balancing of forces. So we'll kind of walk through, you know, what, what exactly that actually looks like. Um, so back back to our model here. Uh, if we go back to physics, we know we have our we have our forces. Um, so our F1 here, which is actually our loading or spring force, uh, that's going to be dependent primarily on the spring rate and the amount that is compressed by that adjustment knob or screw on the top here. And if we go through an F2 here is actually um, our uh, poppet or spring force, and that's going to be dependent on the uh, that uh, small load or that spring rate that's on that poppet spring down there. Uh, this will generally slightly increase as that poppet starts to open. Moving on, then we have our outlet pressure force here. So uh, this is the force that's due to the pressure being exerted from your outlet uh, pressure, that, and that's being exerted on the diaphragm or piston. And then finally, we have our F4 here. So and this is this is on the flip side, our inlet pressure, and this is the pressure being exerted on our poppet area there from our inlet pressure. So as we can see, we have our we have our loading and spring force is pretty much e equal to our poppet outlet and in inlet uh, pressure forces here. So what happens when we actually you know are turning that handle, and how does how does this balance of forces actually work? So as we turn that handle down, we're going to actually start to compress that uh, spring there. That's going to increase our spring force. And so as we are increasing our spring force, something on the right side will need to compensate and balance for that. So as as you can imagine, we've already selected our poppet spring, so that shouldn't be moving. And our inlet force has has a, is, is also constant. So that'll force our outlet pressure force to actually increase, and that'll that'll be how our uh, re regulator actually works. Um, so now that we know how the, how they work, you know, and how, and how they operate. We'll, we'll talk about kind of some of the different uh, performance criteria that you might be seeing, and some of the effects too that also come up a lot during uh, your your uh, operations here. So to start things off, we, uh, we'll we'll talk about lock it here or lock up. So lock up is really the difference in pressure between a flowing and non flowing condition. So you, you can imagine it's right right when you um, start to operate your regulator. Uh, this is dependent on your F2 and F4 if we're going back to our balance of force equation here. So our F2 at this point should be constant because we've already selected our, our um, regulator and F4 will be based, mainly be based on our in inlet pressure. So 
you can imagine that if, if we have a higher inlet pressure, we're going to be tending to see more more lock up here. Um, so as as this is this is happening, um, as as our flow is stopped and the outlet pressure starts to build, the balance of forces is going to favor that control element there, which is going to allow that poppet to seat itself and it's going to close off that inlet pressure. Uh, you can generally get get um, help with this if you're um, using uh, softer seats that'll that'll help and manage this lockup. But we really don't want to be operating our regulators in this uh, larger or this uh, area here of, of our flow curves. Um, uh, and if we move on to the flip side of, of this graph, we're, we'll be focusing on, on that choked flow there. So what choked flow really is, is when the regulator is fully open. Um, at this point, you're not really regulating pressure. Uh, this is this acts more as like a restrictive orifice, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but again, you know, on both flip sides of this flow curve, we really don't want to be operating. So where do we want to be operating on this flow curve if we're if we're um, using this? And then and that'll move us on to our next two segments, which are droop and optimized flow here. So droop is mainly your uh, decrease of your outlet pressure as your flow rate increases. So if the flow demand increases, that poppet is going to open up more and more and it's going to be able to supply the gas through the seat. Uh, this is obviously due to the droop, the drop in the outlet pressure. Um, if we're going back to our balance of equations here, we know that this, this will then be dependent on our F1 and F3, where our F1 will be our, our spring force and our F3 will be our outward pressure. And this is this goes back to that example that I showed earlier, where as you're turning down that handle, you're gonna be increasing your spring force and it'll be out increasing your outlet pressure here. Um, so if we were just to read this graph going from left to right, we can see that as our flow flow demand starts to in, in increase here, our outlet pressure starts to decrease. And that's and that's really what, what droop is. So we want to be operating in this in this area, and if we can get this area to be as flat as possible, that's really really where we can get the most pr predictability out of our re regulators, and also where um, we know that it's operating correctly here. Um, but how do we actually get in that get in that flat range here? So you can always pick when, when you're selecting a regulator, you really want to be picking one that has a, as a control range that's close to your set pressure. Um, if you're dealing with some lower pressures, you want to be using a uh, diaphragm um, sensor instead of a piston. And on the flip side, if, if you're using a high pressure, you should be using a piston sensing regulator. Um, and then just a couple other things to note here, you know, if you have a lower rated spring, that's going to pr provide some better droop performance. But if you go into the dome with re re regulators, you'll have the best droop performance, as you can see in as in, in this example of the flow curve, these lines are quite flat, and this is actually what you'll tend to see a lot in the RHPS series. Also, this is this these these are usually utilizing much larger pressures as well here. Um, so moving on here, uh, next we'll talk about supply pressure effect. So supply pressure effect is something that maybe you might have heard of, you might have not, but it but it tends to be very common if you're using these in uh, gas cylinder ap applications where you're, you're going to see your outlet pressure change. Um, so what supply pressure effect really is, is it's going to be that change in your outlet pressure due to some sort of change in your inlet pressure. Uh, going back to our uh, balance of forces here, we know that F1 and F2 are constant as we've already set our set our range spring and, and we've set that handle and our poppet force has already been selected and uh, that, that won't be changing on us. So then we're left with our F4 and F3. So if we were to increase F4, we're going to tend to decrease F3. But on the flip side, if we were to decrease F4, our outlet pressure will increase there. Um, and, that's, and this all comes back to uh, physics again here. So if you think about force, we know that it's pressure times area. So if we're to take the area of our two um, elements here. We know that we have the poppet and the diaphragm that are acting on each other. And uh, the areas are tend, tend to be quite different here. So for an example's sake, we'll say that our poppet is one millimeter squared and our area for our diaphragm is about 100 millimeters squared. So that ratio comes out to about 1%. So if, if you were to think and have, a, and have a pressure decrease on your inlet side, let's say by 1,000 PSI, your outlet pressure is actually going to start to decrease or in increase by 10, 10 PSI. 
Um, so we'll run through kind of how that looks in in an actual reg regulator ap application here. So let's say we have our bot our um, re regulator here hooked up to a gas cylinder here. So our inlet's coming in at 3600 psi, and uh, we we want it set to be at a uh, 50 psi here for our uh, process. Slowly as our uh, inlet pressure starts to decrease, we're going to drop down to 2600 psi here, and that's going to equal about you know, a thousand PSI drop, which will be one one percent of that will be 10 PSI. And so on the flip side, our 50 PSI will then start to increase and we'll actually be coming out at 60 PSI. So might not be a huge jump, but it's definitely a big, big, bigger difference than what, what we want to see. So how do we compensate for this or, you know, how do we uh, get around this this issue or this 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 effect? Um, generally, you're, you're going to see this in a couple ways, but the most common way to do this would be with a two-stage reg reg regulation system. Um, so if you take the same example that I just ran through here, uh, so we're going to be coming in at uh, 3600 PSI again from our from our gas cylinder, but we're going to be setting it down to 50 again, but then we'll have some sort of middle stage here, either in in with two two separate re regulators or, or a two-stage. And for this example, we're actually going to be dropping more here. So our we've used more and more gas out of our um cylinder here and now we're at 1600 psi uh if so now that, that we've dropped down 2000 psi we know that about one percent of that would be you know 20 psi here so we're actually going to see an increase again of our middle stage here which would be from 500 psi to about 520 psi but now we're going from this middle stage down to our last stage here so now we're going from five 500 to 50. so if we were to take our one percent again of that 20 psi that's only going to be about you know 0.2 psi actually so at, at the very end of this we're only seeing a, a real pressure drop of about 0.2 psi here which would be much different than our than our 10 or 20 psi that we, we would have saw if you we were actually jumping from our 3600 inlet to our 50 outlet and this like i mentioned before you'll generally see this um, if you have you know your your a uh, couple of re regulators in series here um, I also mentioned we do have the two-stage reg regulator that all, that does all of this in, in one um, body here, so makes it makes it much easier to uh, keep keeping track of. Um, so now, if we go into another effect here, we're going to talk about creep. So creep kind of goes through and um, will affect your performance of your re regulators here. So creep is really when your outlet pressure starts to increase over time. Um, this is basically a seat leak, and uh, this can get just as bad as having your outlet pressure equaling your in inlet pressure. Uh, so what, what actually causes this? So as, as you can see in that picture there, I'll, I'll, most of the time it's going to be from a contamination of the seat. So if your seat's not able to properly make that seal and uh, slowly open and close when it needs to, um, you're going to have your pressure leak, leak through. Um, same thing if you were actually going to, to damage your pop or seat, uh, that that seal won't be as tight as it was and you'll end up um, leaking through here. And then you can also see this if you're using these as a shutoff device. Um, it's important to note that re regulators have a very limited shutoff force. Um, and this is especially true at you know such low inlet pressures and if they have been balanced correctly. Uh, it's very, very unsafe to try to use these as your sole isolation point in, in your system. So how do we, you know, kind of get, get around this or, or pr prevent this from happening to our right regulators? Uh, if you're able to, you you can install a uh, filter at, at the beginning of your uh, process there, and that'll, that'll kind of keep all the particulate and contamination out from, from reaching your seat there. Uh, if you're not able to install anything on the upstream side of your regulator, you can always install a relief valve on the downstream, and that's going to prevent any sort of uh, overpressure on, on the outlet side from reaching the rest of your system there. Uh, and then again, if, if, if you're able to, uh, you can always use a shutoff valve upstream of your regulator. That way you're not trying to use uh, these as a shutoff device. Um, and then CV. So we, we've we've talked about CV a couple times here in our previous um, web webinars, but uh, CV for re regulators is calculated much differently than it is for valves. Uh, the CV for a re regulator is actually the measurement of when the uh, re regulator is fully open. Uh, 
And this will tend to vary because your seat will, will throttle or self-actuate. Uh, the flow curves that you see on the right here, these are the best way to determine, you know, what, what sort of CV that you actually need for your app, app application here. Um, and, and these are based on actual flow data. Um, but it's important to note that, you know, CV is there to un understand the maximum flow uh, that you'll be experiencing in case if you have a failure. Um, line size can also be a, 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 a factor that uh, affects your CV. So if you're specking out a reg regulator for, you know, half inch, half inch ends, but then you're actually running quarter inch tubing or, or pipe in, in, into these, that'll be re restricting your flow and that won't be able, and it'll be harder to determine the actual performance of these. Um, so where CV really comes into effect here is, if you're selecting a bigger CV, you'll, you'll see your flow curves will be extended out larger. You'll have you'll have more more flow data. So if you compare the, the top top graph here, where you know you have a CV of 0.02 and the bottom where it's actually 0.2, you, you can see there's there's many more uh, flow flow curves and lines, and they tend to draw out farther than uh, that uh, top graph there. And on the uh, two sort of effects that we that we talked about already. Uh, Bigger CV is going to generally give you more uh, in increased chance of your supply pressure effect and and your lockup. So the higher the CV, that that uh, area of lockup in your regulator, um, but but before it starts flowing, will actually be larger. Um, and that is that is CV. So as as we're moving on here and we're we're running through and we're actually selecting out a, a re regulator here a couple of things that i've that i've noted here that'll kind of help and uh, are actually pretty pretty nice to have so if we're going through and we're specking out a re re regulator it's very important to note obviously the inlet and outlet pressure that we want uh but like i mentioned earlier flow is very very important as well um medium as as well i didn't mention it today but uh liquids uh, tend to operate in a much different realm than uh, gases when you're changing their pressure. So it's important to note if we're going to be using these with either a liquid or a gas. And it's a pretty helpful ones. Obviously, we want to know our our, um, our temperature range and uh, if if we're going to be forced to go into a spring or a uh, load or a dome dome loaded re regulator. And just just a couple other things here that might uh, help us uh, as as we're specking these out and making sure that these work right the first time. Um, so what, what did we set out to do here today? We, we were trying to just get a basics on the overview of reg regulator functions and types. Uh, we really want to be doing this during the design and system e evaluations that we have, and we want to do this so we can make sure that our reg regulator works correctly that first time that we install it. Um, but uh, that is all I have for today. I, I want to thank you guys all for joining us. And now, Jamie, I think we'll move on to some questions if, if we have any. Yep, thanks, Anthony. So like you said, we'll take some time to answer the questions that you have. And I just want to remind everyone that if you do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen with your name so we can add it to our question list. So first off, we have Alex B asking, why am I constantly getting frost on my regulators? OK, yeah, frost on the regulators. That's a good one. <laughs> Um, I didn't mention that here today because generally you don't see it that often, but uh, what you're experiencing there is the uh, Joule Thompson effect. Um, if if you're to go back and think about your ideal gas law, you, your PV equals N NRT here. So if you're dropping your pressure, your temperature is also going to follow suit and drop uh, drop off. And that's 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 where you're going to be seeing um, your frost frost generates, uh, especially in gases. I know in in uh, natural gas cases, uh, just as an example, you know, we'll we'll tend to see a, a couple Celsius drop off just just for for a couple bars. So it's important to note. Um, to to get around this, you you, you can do a couple of things. Uh, you, you can try installing some um, heated lines before and after, so you can try to regulate that uh, gas temperature a bit higher there before it hits that uh, pressure drop. Um, another thing that might be e easier to do is actually to use a two stage re regulator. So. This will help you from, you know, going from such a high uh, pressure to a low pressure, and you, you really want to try to minimize each pressure drop that that gas is experiencing there. All right, great. Next, we have Kyle D asking, does Swagelock have filters built into their regulators? 
yes, yes. Swage lock does have filters built into there. Uh, there's a filter actually installed on that inlet side of your regulator. Uh, the problem with this is that it, if you're dealing with something with such a high uh, solid solids, that filter is going to be very hard to maintain. It'll probably end up getting clogged up pretty pretty quick there. Um, best bet would probably be to have a filter there installed before before the regulator, and then only rely on the one that's built in as, as a backup. Uh, that way, you're able to maintain that filter that's outside and upstream of your regulator easier. Perfect. And then we have Ben W asking, how often should I rebuild a regulator? OK, um, generally we we don't have any sort of set amount of time that uh, reg regulator should be in, uh, re re rebuilt or maintained. Um, it's really all going to depend on your application or how many times the uh, cycling of your, your regulator is, is occurring. Um, I, I would note that it's very important to have some sort of uh, PM schedule um, for for your regulators, and even more important to have um, a spare uh, build kit for your regulators. Uh, don't you don't want to be caught in a case where your regulator starts to fail and you don't have a uh, re rebuild kit on, on hand there, uh, especially when when the rebuild kits tend to have longer lead time. So, I, I always suggest having at least one one re re rebuild kit ready, just at all times, just in case if you, if you have a um, re re regulator fail, but uh, definitely, definitely looking at having some sort of PM schedule there uh, based on your app, app application and how uh, frequently um, you're actually cycling that one. All right, we have time for one more question. Ron C is asking, do swage lock regulators come with gauges installed on them? And how do I specify what gauges I want on it? Okay, yeah, uh, so our standard part uh, for our um, regulators actually will not have gauges installed. Uh, this is a designator that you can change though when you're um, selecting them. Um, if you were to select that um, designator that to have uh, the gauges installed, that the um, that they will come installed based on uh, your control range and your inlet pressure that you're selecting. It'll be um, based off of that. But if you're looking for some, you know, more uh, specific ranges or things that you'd like to see, you can always let us know and we can always create a custom part number there for you and, and we can get the gauges installed on there, specifically the ones that you want to see. All right, um, so that looks like we answered all the questions in the chat. Remember, if you have a specific question that wasn't answered or you come up with it later, please feel free to follow up with your account manager and we can send you an email. So just a couple of things to end on here. After the webinar, everyone who is present during the event will receive a follow-up email with some useful reference documents. And as always, we highly encourage you to take advantage of our technical team as a resource. We're ready to help you with your specific applications and selections, so don't be afraid to reach out. Also, be sure to join us for our next webinar featuring uh, um, protecting our system, which will be next month, July 22nd at 10 a.m. Thank you all for joining us today. And if you have any questions or concerns or any feedback regarding the webinar, please email us at solutions.michigan at swagelock.com. Thanks again for joining us today. For more information about our webinars, please view our website, michigan.swagelock.com.